to fight for the right and to build the nation's might, and the army goes rolling along. It's harder to end a war than begin one. Everything that American troops have done in Iraq, all the fighting and all the dying, the bleeding and the building and the training and the partnering, all of it has led to this moment of success. You deserve better than tyranny and corruption and torture chambers. You deserve to live as free people. And I assure every citizen of Iraq, your nation will soon be free. Thank you. It's 10 years since America invaded Iraq. 10 years and over 120,000 dead, among them over 4,400 American soldiers. This documentary tells one of the great untold stories of the Iraq war how the U.S. administration funded a deadly, sectarian, paramilitary force to fight those threatening the American presence. It was a decision that helped fuel a sectarian civil war that ripped Iraq apart. At its height, three years later, 3,000 bodies a month were showing up on the streets of Iraq. This is also the story of the man the Pentagon sent in to organize and train those paramilitary squads. He's a veteran of America's so-called dirty wars, stretching back to Vietnam and El Salvador. This man was so important to the Pentagon that the then Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, saw fit to forward his personal memos to the president and the vice president. To President George W. Bush, CC, Vice President Richard B. Cheney, from Donald Rumsfeld. The attached memo is from a person we have sent into Iraq from time to time, essentially to work with the Iraqi police. He is smart, tough, and a keen observer. Nonetheless, you have said you like texture, and this is texture. The name Steel was very well chosen, like very steely eyes, and he communicates a steely sort of intent about things. He did have much higher clearance than the rest of us did, and he would make vague references to meetings with the Secretary of Defense and meetings in the White House. I witnessed him observing the crime of a prisoner being tortured in front of him. We're in a room in the library interviewing Steele and I'm looking around, I see blood everywhere. So who is James Steele? And why did the Pentagon choose him to go to Iraq? Vietnam the conflict in which over 58,000 U.S. soldiers died is where James Steele was first introduced to counterinsurgency as an alternative way of combating a guerrilla uprising. Steele served in the Vietnam War in the Black Horse Regiment from 1968 to 1969. He was described by General George Patton, Jr. as the best troop commander in his regiment. But if Vietnam shaped his formative military career, it was in the war against left-wing insurgents in El Salvador that James Steele secured his reputation as the counterinsurgency specialist. Steele arrived in El Salvador in 1984 
as the leader of the U.S. Mill Group, a group of U.S. military advisors to the El Salvadoran army. Todd Greentree got to know James Steele when he was working in the U.S. Embassy in El Salvador at the time. Colonel Steele, as the Mill Group commander, was in charge of all of the Special Forces teams, the, the training teams that were out at the, the, head, the brigade headquarters. The U.S. was trying to defeat a guerrilla insurgency, and American experts trained the Salvadoran security forces in the dark arts of counterinsurgency. Some of these Salvadoran paramilitary units were effectively death squads. Celerino Castillo was a U.S. drug enforcement agent who was involved in training these paramilitaries. He was widely acknowledged for his efforts. Castillo met James Steele in Salvador. A very military type, very disciplined. His decorations, uh, uh, medals and stuff that, that was uh, given to him by the U.S. military and the Salvadoran military were surrounding his office. So I was very impressed with Colonel Steele. Dr. George Vickers got to know and like James Steele when he visited Salvador to write a PhD thesis on U.S. military strategy in Central America. He was totally committed to defeating the guerrilla insurgency in El Salvador. He used to discuss how he traveled around to the military bases where U.S. trainers were based. He talked about the importance of building human intelligence information as opposed to just technical information. I don't think he had any hesitations about obtaining information by very rough forms that were being carried out by the Salvadoran Armed Forces under the eyes of U.S. military trainers. Steele was the chief American counterinsurgency expert on the ground in El Salvador, a figure of enormous authority to the El Salvadoran military. He is the Mill Group commander in El Salvador. Nothing moves without his authority, and their objective was to eradicate the guerrilla movement. It's very well written uh, through history that uh, there were major massacres being conducted. We put these allegations to retired Colonel Steele and have received no reply. By the end of the Civil War, at least 75,000 Salvadoran civilians had died and one million refugees had fled the country. The Salvadoran military halted the advance of the guerrillas, leading some in Washington to believe the U.S. advisory role was a success. So much so that even David Petraeus, then an ambitious 33-year-old major, visited El Salvador to study this counterinsurgency campaign. The young Petraeus even reportedly stayed in Steele's house while there. Eighteen years later, in Baghdad, the now General Petraeus would use Steele's expertise to fight the Iraqi insurgency. The architects of the Iraq war did not expect a violent uprising, so they started training a regular police force for what they thought would be a mostly peaceful transition to a Western-style democracy. They brought in retired policemen like Douglas Brand and Jerry Burke to teach the basics of good civil policing. We went in in May of 2003 uh, with six policemen, six American police officers. This small group was unequal to the enormous task they were given. To train 30 plus thousand policemen was a sort of five to seven year project, but they wanted it done in 18 months. The man seen here in the Navy bulletproof vest, Ahmed Khadoum, was installed as the Iraqi leader of this new civic police force. Hovering in the background is the mysterious figure of James Steele, observing and evaluating the situation sending his classified reports back to U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. Steele had arrived in Baghdad in 2003, just after the invasion, describing himself as an energy consultant. 
came into the country, as I understand it, to work originally for the electricity uh, board. He just sort of showed up one day, went about his business, which nobody really understood what he was there to do. Uh, as I said, he seemed to be without portfolio, doing whatever it is that he wanted to take interest in. This is the only known video footage of James Steele. As a civilian, he had no place in the military chain of command, yet he exercised enormous power in Iraq. The man on his left is the Special Forces Colonel, James Kaufman. He reported directly to General Petraeus. Initially, the security situation in Iraq was relatively stable and the task of training the police continued. But then everything changed. The intensity of the Sunni insurgency surprised the Americans. US soldiers started being killed in increasing numbers. Flag-draped coffins were being shipped home with numbing regularity. The war was becoming unpopular in the United States. George Bush's 2004 re-election was being threatened by the crisis in Iraq. American soldiers were dying at the hands of Sunni Muslims who had lost the most from the fall of Saddam. Now Rumsfeld decided to arm the old enemies of Saddam and his Sunni supporters, the Shia militias. Saddam had killed tens of thousands of Shia during his rule, and now the Shia militias were only too happy to help the Americans put down the Sunni uprising. It was classic counterinsurgency. Paul Wolfowitz announced the policy change before a Senate committee. The approach to those militias is to try over time to integrate them into new Iraqi security forces. Shia militia from all over the country came in truckloads to Baghdad to join the new special police commandos. They were enraged by suicide bombings of Shia civilians and assassinations and kidnappings by Sunni insurgents and Al-Qaeda militants. It was their time and power, an opportunity to take revenge upon former regime elements that had harmed them. Iraq was on the path towards a sectarian civil war. The US Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, confirmed the new policing strategy in May 2004. Uh, they're reading about how <coughs> we're trying to make efforts of uh, placing Iraqi militia to handle the insurgents in Iraq. We had um, a discussion with uh, General Petraeus yesterday. I had a briefing today from a man named Steele who has been out there working with the security forces and doing a wonderful job as civilian, as a matter of fact. James Steele, the counterinsurgency expert, was now the man of the moment. His job would be to build a police commando force. Jim Steele, who's a retired army colonel with incredible bravery and also incredible expertise about police forces in third world countries. He's been in Iraq for the last year. The police units would increasingly be made up of members of Shia militias like the Bada Brigades. Their job was to hunt down Sunni insurgents and their sympathizers. Like El Salvador, it would be a bloody and brutal business. There was no place in this new regime for a conventional police chief like Ahmed Karoum. He was offered a new posting at the United Nations in New York. James Steele was clearing house. Steele said, yes, you should go abroad for a while. Get some rest. They asked me to leave quietly without a fuss. I was escorted to the airport by my bodyguards and Steele came with us. It was also the end of the line for Douglas Brand. Rumsfeld decided that police training in the future would be dealt with by military people. That was a direct instruction from Rumsfeld. And we had a need for some group on the street to restore order. 
And this is where that third force concept came from, this paramilitary special police commando unit. They operate under more under rules of engagement, which is a military term, uh, rather than the rule of law. The last time I saw Steele was when Rumsfeld visited, and there he was. Rumsfeld's choice to take overall command of this new policing strategy was a military star in the making. General David Petraeus was much admired by the American media. The commandos would become the cutting edge of this ambitious general's war against the insurgents. Now, I've spent a little bit of time at the, where you were training the police commandos, and I got the strong impression that you're putting a lot of priority on the police force today. Well, we've helped them develop these uh, special police units. Uh, some of them were their own initiative initially, and great initiatives, like the special police commandos, which they now have uh, nine battalions of those forces, uh, eight of which are in active operations right now. A directive by General Petraeus ordered the formation of these units. But the people who were directly supervising us were Colonel Kaufman and the advisor, James Steele. Adnan Tabit, seen here with James Steele, was a Sunni Iraqi general who had been imprisoned by Saddam. He now headed the Special Police Commandos, which were financed from a $2 billion fund controlled by General Petraeus. General David Petraeus visited me and he started joking with my soldiers. They were all playing press-up games together, and he could see the seriousness of our training. And after that, he sent me two advisors, Steele and uh, Colonel Kaufman. After this first visit by General Petraeus, he promised he would help us in every possible way. And the first help we received from him was he sent me shipment of 150 Dodge pickup trucks. It was the first time the Americans could work with a significant Iraqi force that knew the lay of the land and where to find the insurgents. Senior advisors Steele and Kaufman directed the search for the insurgents. How would you describe the growth of the interaction between Iraqi and American in this particular arena? Particularly these advisor teams, you know, when you live, eat, sleep, and fight and sometimes die along each other, they have become one band of brothers. It's the brotherhood of the close fight. With James Steele at his side, Adnan Tarbit's commandos grew into a 5,000 strong force with a fearful reputation on the streets of Iraq. Steele made a strong impression with the high level, even battle hardened Iraqis he worked with. The best description for him is that he lacks human feeling. I mean, the number of wars he's witnessed and the various methods of torture that must have been committed, whether in Iraq or elsewhere, somehow their hearts have died. General Muntadra al-Samari is a former general in the Iraqi army. After the invasion, he worked with the Americans to rebuild the police force. But Muntada was very disturbed by the abuse and torture he witnessed being committed by the police commandos. He tried on a number of occasions to stop it. He has never spoken before about the part the US played in running the special police commandos. The Ministry of Interior had 14 to 15 prisons. They were secret, never declared. But the American top brass and the Iraqi leadership knew all about these prisons. The things that went on there, drilling, murder, torture, the ugliest sorts of torture I've ever seen. General Muntada alleges that James Steele had access to all of these prisons and that he visited one in Baghdad with him. 
Oh, that's James Steele. Yes, that's James Steele. That's what he always used to wear. Jeans and a leather jacket. I remember he always wore his gun here, on the right-hand side. Dr. Mofak al rubai was Iraq's national security advisor through the worst years of the war. He met James Steele at high-level security meetings. Jim Steele, for me, was a mysterious guy. We sat in the meeting, and he came at the end, pulled the chair and sat there. He did not introduce himself to me. You don't get anybody in these meetings. There were only, only Sanchez, Brahma, myself, Minister of Defense and Minister of Interior, and him, full stop. He was very respected by others, and they listened to what he has to say. One of the main bases of operation for the commandos was the ancient city of Samara. The area was a center for the Iraqi insurgency. It was also Adnan Tabit's hometown, and he was determined to inflict a major defeat on the insurgents and their sympathizers. With James Steele advising, Adnan Tabit's commandos flooded the city, going door to door taking hundreds of men from their homes to the interrogation center. U.S. Army medic Neil Smith was in Samara during the months-long struggle to control the city. We were like in a government zone in Samara, and uh, where the police station was was actually right across from where the uh, commandos were headquartered, so there were always uh, special commandos there hanging out, and they wore the maroon beret, like, Pretty much every uh, elite military unit in the world does. They're well equipped. Like the MOI commandos all had these brand new Dodge Ram pickups that were painted in camouflage. And they all looked like they had new weapons and new uniforms. Samara was the first place that the connection between James Steele and the activities of the police commandos was made known to the outside world. New York Times journalist Peter Maas convinced General Petraeus to allow him and photographer Gilles Perez to visit the commandos in Samara. Their host was James Steele. What I heard is, is prisoners screaming all night long. You know, at which point you have the young US captain telling his soldiers, don't come near this thing. Gilles Perret's stark black and white photographs capture how the commandos worked in Samara. James Steele crops up in these photographs repeatedly. I was staying at the base in Samara, an American base, and I overheard soldiers, American soldiers at this base, talking about having watched prisoners be kind of strung up like animals after a hunt over a bar, um, having watched prisoners be actually tortured. Adnan Tabit and the American military made the joint decision to set up the commando headquarters and interrogation center in the city's main library. We spoke to two men from Samara who were imprisoned in the library. Still fearful, they asked us to conceal their identities. We would be blindfolded and handcuffed behind our backs. Then they would beat us with shovels and pipes. We'd be tied to a spit, or we'd be hung from the ceiling by our hands and our shoulders would be dislocated. They electrocuted me, they hung me from the ceiling, they were pulling at my ears with pliers, stamping on my head, asking me about my wife, saying they would bring her here. The interrogation center was the only place in the kind of mini green zone in Samara that I was not allowed to visit. However, one day Jim Steele said to me, hey, they just captured a Saudi jihadi. Um, would you like to interview him? 
was still completely together to bring us into the library? Maybe not. Mas and Perez were about to get an unprecedented glimpse into this clandestine world. When we kind of walk into the entrance area and the first thing that I see is one of the Iraqi guards beating up one of the Iraqi prisoners. And then I'm taken not into the main area, kind of the main hall, um, although out of the corner of my eye I could see there were a lot of prisoners in there with their hands tied behind their backs. I was taken to a side office where the Saudi was brought in and there was actually blood dripping down the side of a desk in this office. We're in a room in the library interviewing Steele and I'm looking around, I see blood everywhere, you know. And while this interview was going on, me and the Saudi with Jim Steele also in the, the room, there were these terrible screams. There was somebody shouting, Allah, Allah, Allah. But it wasn't, you know, kind of religious ecstasy or something like that. These were, these were screams of, of pain and terror. We asked General Adnan why he thought the prisoners were screaming. Maybe sometimes when officers visit prisons, the prisoners do start shouting. They are a bit like whirling dervishes. They love to scream, Allah, Allah. And they were so loud and they were so disturbing that Steele left the room to go find out you know, what was going on because it was breaking up our, our interview. And while he was gone, the screaming stopped and then he came back into the room and the interview continued. He hears the scream of the other guy who's being tortured you know, as we speak. There's the blood stains in, you know, on the corner of the desk in front of him. There are some killers who would never confess. We have to use tough means to make them confess. All kinds of means. Torture is not humane. I, I don't approve of it. But there are some procedures which you need to understand. You have to follow in order to make criminals confess. I remember Adnan Tarbit came into the library and he told Captain Darade and Captain Ali, go easy on the prisoners, don't dislocate their shoulders. This was because people were having to undergo surgery when they were released from the library. General Adnan had his own explanation for the bloody desk witnessed during Mass and Perret's interview with James Steele in the library. What we had started to do was to make sure that the terrorists didn't have any sharp knives or anything they could harm themselves with because they used to cut themselves and blame us. James Steele wouldn't remain silent about wrongdoing. I'm surprised by this journalist's report. Although James Steele did not respond to our requests for an interview about his activities in Samara, he did tell the New York Times that he opposes human rights abuses. One American soldier in Samara was deeply affected by what he saw. At the time, I just felt like everybody knew and nobody cared that there was torture going on. Army medic Neil Smith remembers just how frightened Iraqi civilians in Samara were of the special police commandos. What was pretty widely known in our battalion, definitely in our platoon, was that they were pretty violent with their interrogations, that they would uh, beat people, shock them with uh, a, you know electrical shock, stab them. Um, I, I don't know what all else, you know, sounds like pretty awful things. If you sent a guy there, he was gonna get tortured and perhaps raped uh, or, or whatever, humiliated and um, just brutalized by the special commandos in order to get whatever information they wanted. I remember a 14-year-old who was tied to one of the library's columns. And he was tied up with his legs above his head, tied up. His whole body was blue because of the impact of the cables with which he had been beaten. The clear priority at that time in Iraq was to not have this incredibly shaky provisional government defeated by the insurgency. That was priority number one 
to which every other priority, democracy, human rights, etc., was subordinate. Petraeus defended his record with the police commandos to PBS Frontline's Martin Smith. He says he was aware of individual militia members in the commandos, but not militia groups. I did not see militia groups uh, in the special police during the time that I was there. Did you think about what you could have done differently, might have done differently? To have prevented the development of these militias that were effectively well, developing I, under your watch? I, again, don't, I have not seen, you know, we, we kept hearing this all the time, Martin, that this uh, or that. Uh, to find the absolute evidence of this has actually been quite difficult. But Jerry Burke, who was a senior advisor in police affairs to the Iraqi Interior Ministry, says that Petraeus must have known that organized Shia militia were dominant in the police commandos. He had to have known. Uh, these things were discussed openly, uh, whether it was at staff meetings or you know, before or after various staff meetings and general conversation. Uh, pretty much the whole world in Iraq knew that the police commandos were about a brigade. He must have known about the death squad activities. Um, again, it was common knowledge across Baghdad. Even Petraeus's own special advisor in the military chain of command, Colonel James Kaufman, was, according to many witnesses, working side by side with James Steele in the detention centers where torture was taking place. Colonel Kaufman declined to be interviewed by us. About General Petraeus's relationship with James Steele, the official speaking for the general said, Steele was one of thousands of advisors to Iraqi units working in the area of the Iraqi police. Journalist Peter Maas, who interviewed Petraeus at the time, remembers the relationship being a lot closer than the Petraeus statement would indicate. It was very clear that they were very close to each other in terms of their command relationship and also in terms of their ideas and ideology about what needed to be done. Petraeus explicitly told me that he believed very, very strongly in the commandos, thought the commandos were successful, and wanted them to become bigger, stronger, and even more prevalent in the fight against the insurgency. International humanitarian law imposes obligations on those engaged in armed conflict regarding the treatment of prisoners. Not only must prisoners not be abused, but those detaining prisoners also have an obligation to ensure respect as well. It is not acceptable to turn a blind eye. It is absolutely the responsibility of every U.S. service member, if they see inhumane treatment uh, being conducted, to intervene to stop it. I don't think you mean they have an obligation to physically stop it. It's to report it. If they are physically present when inhumane treatment is, is taking place, or they have an obligation to try to stop mm -hmm. it. But the masses of secret Iraq war communiques released by WikiLeaks showed that U.S. soldiers were routinely handing prisoners over to the Iraqi police force, even before the police commanders were officially launched. The top U.S. military knew from the soldiers' daily logs that torture was going on inside detention centers. They even issued a new official military order in June 2004. It was called Frago 242. It directed U.S. troops to note, but not investigate, torture of Iraqis by Iraqis, unless ordered to take action by headquarters. But later that month, members of the Oregon National Guard were so disturbed by the abuse they witnessed at a police detention center that they intervened to try and stop it. I saw some horrific things. I saw uh, one room that had um, 75 prisoners all crammed into one one small space and, and they asked for food, they asked for help, and they asked for uh, medical aid. We gave them every bit of scrap of food that we had, every bit of water. You could see evidence of, of a torture chamber where they had a broken uh, lamp where they used electrical shock and it was just it's quite evident what they had been doing to these fellows. Southerl's commander approached the man who appeared to be in charge of this torture center. According to Southerl, 
the man immediately got on the telephone to U.S. military headquarters. Right after he made that phone call, the order came that we were to stand down. We were ordered to pull away right now. I know that it, that order came from someplace very high. We went directly back to our compound and um, the commander called us all in there together and told us that what we saw didn't happen and to forget about it. But the Oregonians didn't forget. They went to the American press and blew the whistle. A high-level U.S. military investigation followed and the torture stopped there. There is no evidence that Steele was involved in this incident. But a year later, the special commanders took over the facility and used it for interrogation and torture. I think there's great continuity, and really if you go back to Vietnam, to the nature of irregular warfare and the fact that there is always a sort of a dark side. It's not called dirty war for nothing. So it's no surprise to see individuals who are associated and are sort of know the ins and outs of that, of that kind of war reappear at different points in, in these conflicts. After a few months of steel in El Salvador, I didn't have any contact with him whatsoever until I saw that Peter Moss article and, and saw that, oh, he's in Iraq. I first heard about Colonel James Steele going to Iraq, and I said, they're going to implement what is known as a Salvadoran option in uh, Iraq, and that's exactly what happened. And I was devastated because I knew the atrocities that were going to occur in Iraq, uh, which uh, we knew had occurred in, in El Salvador. It was not surprising that a warrior like James Steele would appear again. He had been sidelined by the US military after a congressional committee decided that he had lied about his role in Oliver North's illegal gun-running operation against the left-wing government in Nicaragua. However, his work in El Salvador had not been forgotten by powerful Washington insiders, like Vice President Dick Cheney, who knew Steele. Cheney was the first senior American politician to draw parallels between El Salvador and Iraq. Today, El Salvador is a whale of a lot better because we held free elections. The power of that concept is enormous. Well, and it will apply in Afghanistan and it will apply as well in Iraq. Dick Cheney, as a congressman, made any number of visits to, to Central America, as did members of the Reagan administration who were in the forerunners of the neoconservatives that then come into office and, and really take that whole approach to its next level in Iraq. I opened the cover story in the New York Times Magazine that, and saw that it, it, it described the creation of this new police commando unit within the Iraqi Interior Ministry and mentioned that the, uh, the U.S. military advisor in charge of this was Jim Steele. I was probably more alarmed when I started to hear reports a few months later that that particular unit was carrying out death squad activities in Iraq. The publication by WikiLeaks of thousands of diplomatic cables show that by July 2005, the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad was telling Washington about the abuse being committed by the commandos. We also learned that Adnan Tarbit was a guest at the American Embassy in Baghdad. He met the U.S. Ambassador for Counterterrorism and talked about his approach to policing. This is an extract from what he's reported to have said. Summary, fight terror with terror. Major General Tabit, who created and commands the Special Police Forces, is a Sunni officer who served time in prison for attempting to overthrow the Saddam regime. They express the view that it is necessary to fight terror with terror, and that it is critical that their forces be respected and feared, as this was what was required in Iraqi society to command authority. We asked Ambassador Crumpton if he had been aware that Adnan Tarbit's commandos were engaged in torturing detainees. Well, I assure you, if I knew there was torture going on uh, at that time with the people I was talking to, I, I would have raised it and, and discussed it. You're, you're implying that I didn't know that, and I resent that question the way you phrased it, frankly. 
but there are indications that the US government knew what the commanders were doing. We remain troubled by the indications that at times units commanded by Tabit crossed the line. Despite these concerns, Adnan Tabit remained officially in charge until the middle of 2006. He told us that the American officials he dealt with were aware of what his men were doing. Until I left, the Americans knew about everything I did. They knew what was going on in the interrogations, and they knew the detainees. And even some of the intelligence about the detainees came to us from them. They are lying. The police commandos were growing in numbers and importance. They had a national headquarters in Nisur Square in Baghdad. It could hold around 1,000 detainees at any one time and was the nerve center of a national network of interrogation centers. This notorious detention center was situated just outside the fortified green zone and less than a mile from the American and Iraqi Joint Command. Major General Muntada remembers that James Steele and Petraeus's military advisor, James Kaufman, were a constant presence here. He says they were there to receive the high-value detainees from the so-called intelligence committees that operated at each regional commander center. James Steele would come to meetings every day in Nisur Square. We'd all have a big lunch feast together. On a daily basis, the Americans, because Nisur Square was near the American base, they had breakfast with General Adnan Tabid, and then at 12 midday, they had lunch with him. They didn't leave Nisur Square until very late at night. Two Iraqi generals who worked with Steele say that one of Steele's responsibilities was to give the commandos lists of people that the Americans wanted picked up. Steele would then allegedly arrange to transfer them to a US-run interrogation center near Baghdad airport. Colonel Steele is one of the few people who understands how to organize and conduct intelligence-driven operations against specific targets in the leadership and operational cells of, of an insurgency or terrorist organization. Getting that intelligence from detainees was routine for the commandos and their American overseers. <laughs> One of the detainees was screaming. By chance, James Steele was there, outside, washing his hands. He opened the door and saw the detainee. He was hanging by his legs, upside down. James Steele didn't react at all when he saw this man. It was just normal. He closed the door and came back to his seat in the advisor's room. And there was worse. One man who survived Samara and Nisur Square says that the police commandos lied about the fate of some of his fellow detainees. They started releasing some of the detainees. They were claiming that these detainees would return to their families. They were killing them and dumping their bodies on the streets of Baghdad. It became very obvious that this was criminal activity by the special commandos. They were eliminating their own opposition and terrorizing citizens from the Sunni community. We lost the support of a lot of Iraqi citizens who became very cynical and very anti-American. Even the ones who were friendly with us couldn't understand why we were allowing this to happen. Good afternoon, folks. Are you concerned over, and in fact, the United States looking into growing reports of uniformed death squads in Iraq, perhaps assassinating and torturing hundreds of Sunnis? And if that's true, what would that say about stability in Iraq? Comment on hypothetical questions. I've not seen reports that hundreds are being killed by roving death squads at all. I'm not going to get into speculation like that. Well, sir, that's not hypothetical, I don't believe. The Sunnis themselves are charging that 
that hundreds have been, have been assassinated, that? people shot in the head, found in alleys. Um, what you're talking about are unverified, to my knowledge at least, unverified comments. I just don't have any data from the field that I could comment on in a specific way. But Donald Rumsfeld should have known about the death squad activities. James Steele had written to Rumsfeld six weeks earlier, warning him that the police commandos, armed and financed by the US, were effectively a Shia militia engaged in death squad activities. Memo to Don Rumsfeld from Jim Steele. Thugs like the commander of the Wolf Brigade, who has been involved in death squad activities, extortion of detainees, and a general pattern of corruption. Nearly all of the new recruits within the commandos are Shia. Many of them are Barter members. General Muntada resigned from the Interior Ministry. He had come to view the commandos as death squads. Two close colleagues were killed following a summons to the ministry. Their bodies were found on a rubbish tip. He got out of Iraq and fled for his safety to Jordan. Despite the risk, he decided to speak out about what was happening inside the Ministry of the Interior. How many people have been taken by the forces of the Ministry of the Interior, only for their families, to later find their bodies at the morgue. A few days after the broadcast, General Muntada was contacted by James Steele. It seemed that former Colonel Steele had made an unexpected trip to Jordan. He was very anxious to meet with Muntada. James Steele was staying at the luxury Sheraton Hotel in Amman. He asked if they could meet about 7 p.m. that night. Muntada agreed and went to the hotel. He was asking me about the prisons. I was surprised by his questions, and I reminded him that these were the same prisons where we both used to work. I reminded him of the incident where he opened the door and Colonel was torturing one of the prisoners and how he didn't do anything. He said, but I remember that I told the officer off. So I said to him, no, you didn't. You didn't tell the officer off. You didn't even tell General Adnan that this officer was committing human rights abuses against these prisoners. And he was silent. He didn't comment or answer. I was surprised by this. He wanted to know specifically, did I have any information about him, James Steele? Did I have any evidence against him? Photographs, documents, things which proved he committed things in Iraq, things that he was worried that I might reveal. This was the purpose of his visit. I am prepared to go to the International Court and stand in front of them and swear that high-ranking officials such as James Steele witnessed crimes against human rights in Iraq. They didn't stop it happening and they didn't punish the perpetrators. People should know about what was going on because I was shocked when I came back to the States and found out that most people didn't even know that we were involved in torture over there. There is little chance that James Steele will be investigated. Within months of entering the White House, President Obama issued a statement saying, we've been through a dark and painful chapter in our history. Nothing will be gained by spending our time and energy laying blame for the past. James Steele, and David Petraeus left Iraq in September 2005. The ranks of the police commandos increased to over 17,000 and the allegations of abuse against them soared. A year later, the country was in the grip of a bloody sectarian civil war. At its height, the civil war was claiming the lives of 3,000 people a month. Some were so badly tortured they could not be identified. 
Many victims found a final resting place in desolate town dumps like this one. A rusty tin can marks each grave. Adnan Tabit has now retired on an Iraqi government pension and lives in Jordan. Donald Rumsfeld resigned as Defence Secretary at the end of 2006. He never replied to any of our questions. Rumsfeld had presented James Steele with the Distinguished Public Service Medal for his extraordinary service in Iraq. Steele is now living in Bryan, Texas and gives occasional lectures on counterinsurgency. He did not respond to our many requests to be interviewed for this documentary.